Due to a very, very unique opportunity, I have the privilege of going to Israel. and welcome back to the channel. I just wanna take a quick moment and say thank you to all of our new subscribers. The channel has grown so much in just the last couple weeks alone. So thank you guys for joining the team. And if you're new here and you haven't subscribed, just hit that button down below. We post new content every week. Speaking of new content, this video is going to be a little unusual compared to what we normally do. So the intention was for this to be a vlog. However, I didn't get the opportunity to film in all the ways that I normally do. So this is going to be me walking you through my journey and taking you through the, the clips that I was able to film and all the things that I learned along the way. Not too long ago, I got the opportunity to go to Israel. And to be honest, this isn't really a country I thought I'd ever have the fortune of going to visit. My time there was an absolute whirlwind. I got to spend a little bit of time in a handful of locations, not all of which were the most exciting things to see on camera, but I'll explain why in a little bit. But first off, getting to Israel. It was not the most easy country to get to, logistically speaking. It was a direct flight, about five hours from England, which which was nice, but I had to take a COVID test within 48 hours of arriving in Israel and then another one once I got to the airport. The airport was pretty easy to navigate, pretty intuitive. Um, most of the signs had an English translation on there, which I appreciate because I don't read Hebrew. And um, once I landed, I went to a kind of self-service kiosk thing. And at that, it printed off this little blue like visitor's pass. It kind of looks like an American driver's license if it was printed on like a receipt. And then I took that over to border control and they did all the usual questions and they wanted to see my COVID documentation, show that I'm fully vaccinated. And then once I cleared them, I went and picked up my checked baggage. Then it was time for my COVID test. So I took my bags over to the line. There was a big line of people that were waiting to actually purchase their test. However, I prepaid and if you're gonna go, I recommend that you do that because I gotta skip that line, go straight to my guy. We did the COVID test and the results came pretty quickly. I was supposed to quarantine. However, by the time I got a taxi, got to the hotel, checked in and then unloaded my stuff, I already had the results. So there wasn't really much of a quarantine that needed to be done. My trip was kind of all over the place. I gotta spend a night in Tel Aviv which means the Hill of Spring in Hebrew. And it's a very populous city, lots of things happening. Uh, my group and I went to a kind of hole in the wall pizza place that to be honest, looked like it was something that like you would get your kidney stolen at. It was just in a, like a dark alley with the guards at the door and they were checking our vaccine cards. But once we got there, they opened up the door and it was just all of this beautiful light and live music and there was greenery everywhere. And we had the best pizza and we had beer and we just kind of hung out and we enjoyed that time. We also got some really good ice cream from a shop not too far from that. I got salted caramel and salted Oreo, which who knew that was a thing? And they put this little cone on top filled with like the syrup of your choice. It was so good. Besides that, I just kind of walked around Tel Aviv and it was kind of getting dark at that point. So none of the footage I really took was useful at all. But overall, there's like lots of beaches and really beautiful sunsets. And it was a good, good night there. I had a few other random adventures along the way. We tried to go and visit the city of Capernaum, which I'm sure I am saying wrong, but it's mentioned in the Bible a couple times. The first few disciples are from there, and then there was also some pretty miraculous events performed there as well, including some healings and um, some of Jesus's teachings were done there. In fact, the synagogue there is the same one that John 6:22, I am the bread of life promise was said. My group and I drove all the way out there just to find out that the area we wanted to visit was closed, which was pretty unfortunate because we didn't miss it by a lot. I think we got there at about one o'clock and found out that it closed at 12. So if you're gonna make the drive over there, be aware. One, the traffic was 
horrendous. It took us about three and a half hours, even though the GPS said it was only gonna take about two. And also check the times, <laughs> it's worth doing. Uh, so you don't make the trek like we did just for no avail. But I mean, I guess it wasn't completely pointless. There was a bunch of flowers there that kind of lined the path up to the gate. They were gorgeous. And if you peek through the gate, you could see the Sea of Galilee just on the other side. One of the biggest things I got to do while I was there was go and visit Yad Vashem. I'm about to go into the Israeli Holocaust Museum. I don't know what I'm going to be able to film there, but if I am able to film, I'll make sure that I put that in right after this and then I'll catch up with you afterwards. We're going to be uh, spending a couple of hours in the Holocaust Museum, which is very short. Then we can spend a couple of days. So we'll be selecting we stop at the DC and then we'll be going to finish with another memorial that we see on this campus. That's the plan for today, okay? The museum there is actually quite massive. When you include all of the grounds, it's about 44 and a half acres. And there are a few different components. The grounds are filled with trees and bushes and greenery, all sporting a plaque dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust. Some have individual names and others say stuff like the people of Denmark. And our guide let us know that despite that, there still aren't enough plants for to have a dedication to all of the people lost. There's an art gallery as well that we walked through. It's pretty impressive. It's actually the largest collection of art by um, Jewish people and other victims of the Holocaust. And it's intermixed with memorials that are dedicated to the different parts of the atrocity. There was also an entire quite large structure dedicated to the child victims of the Holocaust. I think that that area was a good example of just how intentional this museum is. The entire structure was very dark, which was just different than the rest of the museum, and it didn't feel like an accident. The main hub where we spent most of our time, and I wasn't allowed to film that much, uh, was a giant concrete triangular prism looking thing. We did the whole thing in about two hours with our guide. However, if you wanted to go through and read every plaque and listen to the audio self-guided tour that you can take, you could probably spend days upon days there. There's just so much to see. When you walk into the building, it's gigantic. The ceilings are very high and the walls and the floors are both concrete, but the sky way up above is a skylight that runs the entire length of the building. It's about 200 meters. And our guide let us know that that skylight represents the fact that the Holocaust didn't happen behind closed doors. It happened right out in broad daylight. The whole museum kind of zigzags, so as you go through, you kind of swerve to the right and then the left again and then the right again. Uh, there's no straight path through, um, just kind of like history. Like I said, everything is extremely intentional in there. And after about, gosh, we were probably three quarters of the way through, your feet start to ache. There's not really like a lot of spots to sit and you're standing on concrete and you're reading all of this stuff and like your body physically starts to feel uncomfortable. And our guide let us know at that point that like that's also meant to be that you're supposed to feel physically uncomfortable while walking through that museum. The last room in the museum is called the Hall of Names. So Yad Vashem is taken from the book of Isaiah and it roughly translates to a memorial and a name. The museum has a goal to put a name to every victim and every survivor that was subjected to the atrocities of the Holocaust. And our guide let us know just how impossible that is because there were towns and entire villages that were completely wiped out and there's no one left to remember and name those people. However, this last room really shows how much work they've done and how many people were impacted by this. The room as you walk into it opens up into a large circle and it's kind of filled with smaller circles. Right in the innermost circle is a deep, deep well with a pool of water at the bottom. And if you take a peek right over the edge of the railing, you can see it reflects a display of photographs that are positioned directly above. And it's commemorating all of the names of the victims who remain unknown. The outer edge of the room is filled with hundreds and hundreds of binders. And at some point the binders just kind of come to an end before they finish wrapping the whole room and it's supposed to be space left for the testimony that's yet to be given. At the very end, you come outside to a beautiful site of the Jerusalem forest. And it's just kind of feels like you can breathe out a sigh of relief. If you are ever, ever in Jerusalem, go and see this museum. It's 
absolutely breathtaking and I did no justice to explaining all of the things that you see throughout the entire museum. Last but not least, I went to Jerusalem for a day. Like, how can you go to Israel and not go to Jerusalem? So first off, this was very different than what I thought it would look like. I don't know whether it's just like Sunday school classes giving me a wrong idea, but I thought it was gonna be really flat and it wasn't. Like everything felt hilly, like almost mountainous. There was even some parts we entered through Jaffa Gate and if you looked out, you could see Bethlehem over the ridge and it's just hills upon hills leading up to it. And once we were inside Jaffa Gate, it also felt way different than I imagined. And this part has probably contributed to COVID. Just the videos I've seen, it felt like it was packed with people and it was kind of scarce. Like there wasn't that many people, which kind of made the vendors a little bit more edgy, I think, than they might be before. Um, most people were very sweet. However, there was a couple people that they would heckle you as you walked down the street. Some would yell at you or um, kind of even like, I don't know, write you off. And we even had one guy that followed us for about three blocks. It felt pretty harmless. It's just not a great feeling, but I mean, you can't really blame them. Like their whole livelihood was wiped up by COVID and we're some of the first tourists they've seen in like the better part of a year. For the most part, we did all of the big name things that you wanna do while you're there. We went to the Mount of Olives and we peeked into the Garden of Yosemite, which was another thing that was closed when we went to go see it. We also went to the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall and it was way bigger than I had imagined as well. It's about 60 feet high and over 1600 feet long. When you get there, they have security checks at every entrance, just like bag checks and metal detectors, things that you would see at important monuments. And they also had hand washing stations throughout. So you would see like mothers bathing their kids or people washing their hands before they went up to the wall. They had a few places that you could get paper. However, I would probably bring your own if you were gonna go and you wanted to write a prayer just because they might not have it there when you go. After people would write down their prayers, they'd go up to the wall and they'd put it into the cracks of the wall and then you would see them walking backwards because they don't wanna turn their back on the wall as a sign of respect. The wall itself was divided into males on the left and females on the right. The male section was quite a bit bigger and our group had to split up for a short period of time and then rejoined after we got to spend our time at the wall. That seemed to happen more times than I might expect throughout the entire visit. Um, like if, for example, if we wanted to find a bathroom, the male bathroom always seemed to be right exactly where we would want one. And then the female bathroom would kind of be like off to the side, around the corner, like you'll find it when you find it kind of thing. The food in Israel was so, so good. We had shawarma pretty much at every opportunity that we got. Um, it reminds me very much of a gyro, like the way it's cooked, it's, it's rotated and then it's sliced, similar to like how a gyro is. And then pretty much every time we had a sit down meal, they would bring pita and hummus and then sometimes a variety of other things. That was never anything that we ordered. It was just kind of brought to the table and then it would always appear on the check afterwards. But we never complained because it's delicious, so I will take it. Pretty much the only time we made a mistake while eating is there was one place that we sat down at, ate our whole meal, and then we were way overcharged for it. So I would say if you're gonna go there, either have the price listed on the menu, but if you don't see it, ask them what it's gonna cost before you consume all their food, because then you're just kind of stuck paying with whatever they told you to pay. Last but not least, my favorite location that we went to, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It's located in the Christian quarter of Jerusalem, and it contains two of the most famous sites in all of Christianity. This area alone is, is breathtaking. I, I have no words. Beside me is the, the stone in which Jesus died on. I also got to visit the stone in which they anointed his body, and then the tomb that they laid his body to rest in. There is definitely something incredibly special about this place. Um, not just the significance of it, but just the pure beauty of it. The walls, the ceiling, the floors, the paintings, even the ceiling behind me, I mean, it looks gorgeous. At first I thought it was a painting, but when you look closer, it's all individually laid tiles. There's so many different religions and sections of religions that are all competing and vying over for the same space that you'll see even different types of artwork in here. So behind me, the ceiling, part of it is painted, which is the Greek Orthodox side, and part of it is tile, which is the Catholic side. 
There are so many denominations throughout the entire property. And like I said in that clip, you can actually see that throughout the art in the entire building. There are several chapels throughout the entire building as well. I'm not smart enough on the subject to label exactly which ones were which, but we got to explore pretty much all of them and they are all gorgeous in their own ways. I'm positive that there's tons of stuff that I missed, but my favorite things we got to see were the rock in which Jesus died upon, which was one of the first things that you see when you enter the building. It's just off to the right and it's encased in glass. But if you go up the very steep stairs to the top, there is a small area that you can kneel down on and then you can reach your hand down a hole and the hole goes to about your elbow. Right next to that rock is the stone of Yunction, which I'm probably saying wrong again but it's the stone in which Jesus's body was laid to rest and then removed from the crucifix when it was being prepared for burial and being anointed. It's one of the first things that you see when you walk into the church and many people come to pray beside it, kiss the stone, lay their objects upon it so they too can become anointed with the oil. And just down the hallway from that in the very next room is the tomb in which his body was set to be buried before the resurrection, which is why the church is also known as the Church of the Resurrection. They allow you to go inside. It's kind of a two-part vessel. The first part is a small circular room, and then if you duck under a very short archway, there's another very, very tiny circular area that is a small shrine. It only fits about two to three people, and it's lit with candles, and it's gorgeous, and it, it's just very, very special to be a part of it. The church was an incredible sight to see. If you have even the smallest ounce of religious bone in your body, it's worth going to. And even if you're not religious, it's an incredible place to be. You can feel it in the air when people are walking around, how truly powerful it is. And COVID kind of made this experience extra special. Um, in some ways, we were talking to a priest and he let us know that before COVID, Sometimes the line was two to three hours long just to get into the building, but we walked straight in and didn't even know the wiser. It was a once in a lifetime experience to see this building the way it was while we were there. And that was my trip to Israel. Like I said, kind of an unconventional video, but it was also kind of an unconventional trip. Thank you guys so much for watching. It was a lot of fun to make this one. It was a, an experience of a lifetime and I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. If you're new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. We've got new videos every single week. Hit the notification bell so that way you're notified when they're updated. And don't forget to follow us on social media. All of those links down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.